Okay, welcome to the first session. Um, you'll see that this is down to be an hour and a half session. Uh, this may have been scheduled because when I do coding talks, I always, always, always run over. Um, and I always have to miss stuff out and still run over. This is a somewhat softer talk. Um, I gave one of my first somewhat softer talks last week at Urdev about technical communication um, in an enormous hall that sort of could seat about 850. Um, and it was half full, which was extremely scary. So uh, you're, you're a slightly more manageable crowd, let's say. Um, but even so, this is, this is still slightly out of my comfort zone by being slightly less um, about a specific bit of code. I will give a few demos of some evil code though. So just out of interest, how many of you, okay, let's start with how many of you are professional C-sharp developers? Oh, quite a few, okay. Uh, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Um, add to that people who can at least read some C-sharp. Right, so that's most people. Okay, hands down, hands up if you're completely, uh, if you don't know C-sharp and don't even know Java, which is kind of very similar. Okay. So I'm not going to lose everyone in the C-sharp coding bits. That's a good start. OK, a uh, few bits about me. Um, I'm assuming most of you are on Stack Overflow. So obviously, that's where most people have heard of me from. Um, I'm a Google software engineer, but I have to say that I am not speaking on behalf of Google today. Don't treat anything I say as being Google's opinion. Um, I can say that Google's a fabulous place to work. We have an office just in Victoria. If any of you are interested in working at Google, please, please, please come and talk to me later. Uh, it really is brilliant, even though I don't get to use C Sharp. Um, I have a book, C Sharp In Depth, as John mentioned. Um, it's good that I don't have to do too much of the marketing stuff myself. Um, and my, my home languages, as it were, are C Sharp and Java. Considering that I think it's a good idea to be a polyglot developer, um, I'm remarkably thinly skilled, let's say. I don't do web, I don't do JavaScript, I don't do Ruby, Python, etc. I can read a bit of Python. I used to do a bit of C and C++, but I'm feeling a lot better now. Um, <laughs> so even though most of the examples and most of what I talk about today are in terms of C Sharp and a bit of Java, um, I believe that the principles here apply to many other languages. There's a caveat to that, which I will come to later, which you may be able to do something about within your own communities. So normally, I'm kind of somewhat known, and I have no idea how this came about, for being quite nice. People are always tweeting after conferences, oh, just been to see John Skeet, and I'd love them to say, fantastically te uh, technically accurate, gave a brilliant impression, I'm going to change my life. But they say, he's so nice. <laughs> I'm not really sure where that comes from. But today, I'm going evil. <laughs> um, I've always, at least for the, for the last few years, I've had um, a fondness for doing evil things in code. And my aim today is to encourage you all to embrace that inner evil. Solely for the sake of self-education, um, occasionally helping people out, usually with warnings saying, please don't do this. Um, I always get, when I post something on Stack Overflow that has warnings saying, please don't ever use this code, it's horrible, there's always a comment saying, you know that's going to show up in production somewhere. Um, I would like to think that if people really ignore that sort of warning, then they're, they're already asking for trouble. Um, but one of the points of today is that even though I have a kind of bizarre reputation via Stack Overflow, um, as John says, you don't have to be a genius to be a developer, which is a good job because I'm really not. I'd like to take some opportunities to show how I go about thinking up evil code and show that there's really nothing special about it, uh, nothing special about me. Um, you can all do this very easily. So one of the bits of background, um, one of the things that's going to be important is the specification in this case, the, the C-sharp specification. Now, I started looking at the C-sharp spec um, actually four companies ago, three companies ago or something, um, back when the ECMA specification was the one to get. How many of you have uh, 
download it and let us back. Did you know they will send you a copy in hard copy for free? You just email them and say, could I have a copy of the C-sharp spec, please? And they send it to you. You get a, an enormous package back, completely for free. Um, I've no idea why, particularly. But that was my first copy of the C-sharp spec. And then um, at the next company I was at, I happened to be pair programming with a friend of mine. And we noticed something odd. Uh, we noticed a conversion that I didn't think would have worked to do with emails. Not terribly relevant. I thought, I'll look it up in the spec. So I did, and then I got in touch with John Jagger, who was the UK ECMA convener for the C-sharp committee, um, that sort of ratified, after making a few changes, what Microsoft had already sort of pioneered. Um, and that got me into looking at specs and reading specs, which sounds extremely sad. <laughs> it really does. And I realised that it's that it seems sad. Um, but I'd encourage you to do it, because these days specs are better than they were. I remember when I first read the Java, or bits of the Java language specification, I thought this was the best thing since sliced bread. I had never read a spec that was so clear. And unfortunately, it hasn't really held up, in my view, um, to the moving times where specs have been getting better and better, and we've been demanding them more and more. So that's one of the bits that I'll, I'll touch on is we should really be using languages which are specified. So it's not just me today. To help me, I have... <laughs> Whoopsie, wrong map. Sorry, Tim. Tony the Pony, who you may have seen. Out of interest, how many of you were at the 2009 Dev Days? A few. Right, so this is Tony the Pony. He is not a very good developer. He's, he's not terrible. As we learned in 2009, he has problems with dates and times and numbers, but we don't use them very often in computing, do we? No, um, he has the same problems that everyone has. And he does some silly things. So here's some of, C, uh, some of Tony's code. Yep. So this is, this is for authenticating um, a user in his database. Now, Okay, he's now aware that he shouldn't be having the password itself in the database. So yeah, it's, it's not that there's a hashing problem. We know about that. Then. Yeah, he's happy with that. Um, but did you know it's still vulnerable, this code? Okay, Tony's a bit confused. Yeah. What if someone puts in a password with a quoting? So... We think Tony could do with a bit of help. Fortunately, Tony is not working on his own. He is working with... <laughs> evil Code Hench Kitty. Yes. I won't tell them that your name is really Tiddles. No, I didn't say it out loud. No, no, the mic was off. It's okay. So, Evil Code Hench Kitty loves writing clever code. She's a rock star developer, and she knows her language backwards. She has read the spec. She can quote the spec verbatim with the section numbers without looking it up. So she has taken Tony's nasty SQL injection code and come up with this. Tony's a bit confused because it looks very much like the code that we had before. I never thought I would end up with one puppet talking to another on the same <laughs> This is the height of technical conferences, really. Uh, but no, you see, Evil Code Hench Kitty's code has this four SQL um, extension method on any object, well, in fact, a generic extension method to avoid boxing. Um, and then that's returning something, and we can't see the type here, but it's then overloaded the plus operator for strings, and then it's actually ended up um, being of type dynamic so that you can assign it to a SQL command, or you can assign it to an OLADB command, or you can assign it to an Oracle command, and it will dynamically come up with the right thing, creating a command with an appropriate bit of SQL um, and all the parameters filled in. Thank you very much. Do we like this code? No. No, why don't we like this code? 
because it's clever. It's unclear as to what's going on. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you see, poor Tony hasn't a hope in hell of understanding what this code is doing. Um, I haven't actually implemented this code. I did just about enough to prove that um, you can make a dynamic object convert to whatever target type you want it to, and it can tell what you're trying to convert it to. Um, but that's all. I believe this would be possible. I wouldn't want to do it. I think that's enough of Tony and Evil Code Hatch Kitty. So it's so cunning, it's not obvious. We have the three of us in a sort of spectrum, a sort of continuum from, apologies Tony, too dumb to get it right, to too smart to make it clear. And obviously we want this middle ground where we can sit and write good code, which is smart enough to be right, potentially smart enough to express itself in a way which is a bit unusual, so long as it's still clear. And when we're reading code from other people, we always want to know what's going on. We want to be able to explore our language to the boundaries, push those boundaries, and then know when to come back. So, we need a tool. We need books. Diddles, is this the book I should be, uh, be using? No, Tiddles says no. In this case, this is the book to be using. Um, specifications, I've, I've probably gone on about specifications enough now. The C-sharp spec is lovely, and it's even better when it's annotated, so that you don't just find out what the language does, but some guidance from, well, I'm there as well, but you know, some, some really expert people like Eric Lippert, um, Bill Wagner, etc., saying, this is why the language was designed in this particular way. If we'd gone a different way, we'd have had other problems. So I can thoroughly recommend whatever language you're in, get hold of the best version of the specification. That's your major tool in order to think in evil. I'm going to keep that around because I will need it later on. Now, does anyone know what this is? Excellent. How did you happen to recognize that particular picture? Because it's the classic picture of a Jabberwocky. It is. <laughs> I'd like to read you a, a bit of Jabberwocky in three different languages. And the aim of this is to show how some languages are appropriate for some tasks and others aren't. So the first stanza in English. "'Twas brillig, and the slithy toves did guard and gimble in the wave, all mimsy were the borough groves." and the moon rats out gave a grave thing. Now in German, and please, I don't speak either German or French, I did them to GCSE and that's it, um, so apologies for any pronunciation, but hey. Es brillig war die schlichten Toven, wirten und dinnten in Waben, und alle mimsige Burgoven, die murmere outgraben. Or in French, il brieg, les toves le brisier, se gérant en vrillant dans la guave, en mime sans les gouges bosques et le mumrade au grave. And then later on, one, two, one, two, and through and through the vorpal blade went snicker snack. He left it dead, and with its head he went galumphing back. And in German, ein, zwei, ein, zwei, und durch und durch sein vorbus schwert ze schnifferschnuck. Da blieb es tot, er Kopf in Hand gelampf, so zurück. Or in French, un, de, un, de, par le milieu, le glaive vaut par le patapin. La bête de fête, avec sa tête, il monte un galonfon. Which did you prefer, the French or the German? The German. It just works better for what they're trying to do. Some languages lend themselves to evil. <laughs> some lend themselves to good evil and some lend themselves to bad evil something like C-sharp has become better for evil um, over time things like extension methods lambda expressions um, dynamic in C-sharp 4 all push the boundaries of the language out of it, let you do a bit more interesting things 
it's also good because it's well specified. If you have a language where you can't predict what some code will do, then you can do evil, you can do bad stuff with it, but you can't do really evil stuff. You see, my vision of good evil code is code which does something useful and has some appeal to it. It's tempting you. Okay, if it's just being rubbish at you, or if it's so dense and incomprehensible that no one would ever take it on board, then that doesn't count as truly evil. There has to be something appealing so that you could find someone who'd say, that's a really good idea. If you can't tempt anyone, it's not truly evil. So there are languages where you can do bad stuff, but it ends up looking so messy that it's just not worth it. Or you can do stuff that is not going to be well specified and is broken. And that, that lacks the elegance of true evil. So, that's the end of that example. Um, that actually came up from a Stack Overflow question, not saying, how can I do this? but saying, you know, why isn't such and such compiling? And the answer was, well, the, uh, the type constraints aren't part of the signature and they're not checked as part of overload resolution. So part of what we needed. But it was going that far, reading the spec and thinking, Joe, you know, I've answered it to the question of satisfaction, so it looks all shiny and as though I know what I'm talking about, but I've reread the spec and I really don't understand it properly. You could argue that knowing the details of that only makes me a better developer if I come across insane code that should never look and never be in a code base in the first place. But I believe that just having a, a deeper grounding, really grokking, how many of you have read Stranger in a Strange Land, Robert Heinlein? The idea of really grokking something so that it becomes part of your fundamental being. If you're at one with your language to that extent, um, then I think that can't help but make you a better developer. Not so that you can astound your colleagues by giving them code they'll never understand, but just by feeling the right path that a language leads you down. Sorry, that was meant to be the reaction to, um, to that last example. Now, I don't want to give the impression that all of this is strictly to do with um, computer languages. Doing things for the enjoyment of being a bit out of the norm, being a bit odd, um, happens in normal language as well. And Stephen Fry gave a speech somewhere that uh, was then captured, five minutes of it are captured on YouTube, and if you um, search for Stephen Fry kinetic typography language, you will find something that includes this bit. And he's mostly ranting about um, how people are too pedantic. And my wife used to be a book editor um, and is now a children's writer. Um, and as software engineers, we're pedantic. So you can imagine you know, the levels of pedantry that my wife and I get up to together um, holds no bounds. But Stephen Fry makes a good point. He used to be a pedant and he's been trying to wean himself off it. And he says... There are all kinds of pedants around with more time to write and imitate Lynn Truss and John Humphreys than to write poems, love letters, novels and stories, it seems. They whip out their sharpies and take away and add apostrophes from public signs, shake their heads at prepositions which end sentences and mutter at split infinitives and misspellings. But do they ever bubble and froth and slobber and cream with the joy of language? Do they ever let the tripping of the tips of their tongues against the tops of their teeth transport them to giddy euphoric bliss? Do they ever yoke impossible words together for the sound sex of it? Do they use language to seduce, charm, excite, please, affirm, and tickle those they talk to? Do they? I doubt it. They're too farting busy sneering at a greengrocer's less than perfect use of the apostrophe. Well, sod them to Hades. 
And I thought that was just a beautiful way of expressing... Clearly, Stephen Fry has the same sort of joy with language that I do with C-sharp. Just with experimentation. And at other points in the same speech, he makes the point that many of us rail against um, the somewhat American, or at least uh, stereotypically American, habit of verbing nouns. Turning perfectly good nouns into verbs. And he gives the example of actioning something. I will action that item later on. But he then points out that Shakespeare himself had so much fun with language that he turned all kinds of nouns into verbs. As Stephen Fry suggested, he chaired the meeting where nouns became verbs. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with doing this playing around. I said earlier on that you don't need to be a genius to do it. I would suggest you possibly need to be a genius or at least have a really good understanding to turn it into something actually good. So the sort of boundary between evil and good can be quite fiddly sometimes, quite hard to discern. It's not like good and evil in the real world. We never say, Joe, you know, if that Stalin had just killed a few more million people, He'd have been really good. But the way it works in language, somehow you get an idea and you make it quite nasty and use a few... ...with x namespace ns equals some URL. An implicit conversion from string to another type. I don't like implicit conversions, they mean I can't see what's going on. It then gets worse. We've got op operator overloading of plus as well. That's now creating an X name. X elements constructor takes an X name, and when you take a namespace and a string, you end up with an X name, or if I hadn't had the namespace bit, it would have then used an implicit conversion from string to X name anyway. This is all sounding very worrying. Okay, well, let's leave the name bit. Now let's see what overloads are available if I do this. Uh, it helps if we have the right using directive. We have five overloads available. Okay, we can take another. I'll just read the overloads out as, um, as they're coming up too small. We can take another X element. I'm fairly happy with that. Copying one X element for another so we can then modify it, fine. Taking a name, fine. Streaming X element, fine. Okay, taking an X name and object content. That doesn't sound very that doesn't sound very strongly typed. I'm used to my strongly typed, statically typed C sharp that's gonna catch any errors I have. And the other overload is even worse. It's a params object content. How can this possibly be right? I mean, I could put anything in there. I could put maybe I want to put an attribute. Maybe I want to put some text. Maybe I want to put a GUID. What on earth is it going to do with those things? They're, they're all completely different. I couldn't possibly have even specified it in an overload if I wanted to without knowing that I want exactly an attribute and a string and a GUID. What if I give it an array of things? Nothing's going to stop the compiler at this point. And so we, we have to say, what's it going to do when we run it? Oh. Those are as... Uh... <coughs> Thank you. And I believe the evil overload resolution is also going to complain because of the aforementioned bug. Right, now that it's compiling... Oh, well, we seem to have 
an XML element with an attribute, and then the content that we've given, which was a string, and then it's given a GUID, and it's got two more elements. Well, OK, well, let's look at the code. Turns out that is actually kind of exactly what we said to do. So for all my railing, this code does exactly what it looks like it should do. And that's the joy of link to XML. If you want to find out exactly how the conversions are done, and when it decides how to treat an array or any other iterable thing, it's all well specified. And it's done so that if we wanted to have um, you know, from, oh, let's just do it, from type in um, type of uh, string assembly get types. Um, select new X element. We've got a, a random link expression in the middle of there, selecting a sequence of elements, and we end up with child elements for everything. Um, every single type in MS Corelib comes out as an X element. It's insanely useful, but it was really carefully designed to violate all the rules in the right way. I haven't even shown you half of the conversions available, so let's do something else. What can we do with a null reference? Does it make any sense to try to cast it to text? What should that do? Well, I suppose actually, under normal circumstances, it should return null. If if this were doing a normal cast, then you know if if X, if this were object, then the cast from null to null would be okay. And that's exactly what happens here. But we typically have this not as directly null, but the result of asking for a particular element and that result will be null if the element can't be found. And we don't just have string, we can say, okay, maybe we've got a value, maybe not. Um, so if we just element dot element doesn't exist, our cast from an x element value, returned by x element, sorry, by element, to int question mark, will return the converted value of the element to an integer if that element exists, or null if it doesn't. It's a sort of absence propagating. Not really a monad, I'm trying not to look Robert in the eyes. Um, <laughs> I talk about monads where he's going to know rather more than me. Um, but it, it, it allows for null propagation in a really easy way or absence propagation. None of it should work, but it does. Here's another example. Uh, how many of you use Java? A few, yep. Yeah. Um, any of you use Juice? Google Juice, yep. Yeah. Um, so, Java generics. What a laugh they are. Um, Java generics are um, interesting in various different ways in terms of what they don't allow and what they choose to forget. So you can't represent as a class literal the idea of list of string. So in Juice, normally Juice is a dependency injection framework and you try to bind things so that you say, if you ever need a throbbing factory, then construct one of this implementation. And then over in your um, service code you say, I will create a, a constructor that takes a frobbing factory, and that's all fine. And you do that binding by saying bind, you know, injector.bind, whatever, um, frobbing factory.class to new frobbing factory, or maybe to the, the implementation class, whatever it is. You can't do that using list of string. If one of your services needs to take a list of strings, you can't do that by doing list of string.class, because Java just doesn't have the idea of it. 
So you use this new type literal thing. And these are meant to be curly braces at the end. And they're absolutely required. Because what this is doing is creating an anonymous inner class, which subclasses type literal list of string. Now normally, there's this thing called type erasure, so if I do list of string x equals new array list of string, and if I do x dot get class, that will say, oh, I'm an array list. I don't know what kind of array list I am, I'm just an array list. But if you derive from something and it knows its base type, as the generic type, then it keeps that information. So that's how type literal works, by saying, I am the type literal representing the generic type parameters of my base class. Does it make any sense? Is it something you would design if you, if you had the chance of doing anything else? Absolutely not, but it works. And for the sake of everyone seeing it for the first time and going, oh, it's actually, you know, it's just a couple of braces. This is a workaround for a language deficiency. I have one of these for C-sharp, not this, but a workaround for another language deficiency. In C-sharp, you cannot express a generic constraint on a method or type to say T has to be an enum or a delegate. There was some rumour that this was because the CLR wouldn't support it. In fact, if you look at the ECMA spec for IL, it's given as an example of if you want to express, or this constraint in IL means it has to be an enum value, and you say it can't be, uh, sorry, it must be a struct as well as deriving from system.enum. So it can't be system.enum itself, it must be an actual enum type. So I came up with a library called Unconstrained Melody, um, which provides a bunch of generic methods on enums, because that's really useful to do. The, the normal enum type, if you want to do enum.parse, well, it gives you back an enum. I think there are generic overloads in .NET 4, but they're still, you know, you could still ask it to parse an enum, excuse me, as a GUID, because the normal c -sharp constraints can't do any better than that. However, if you build a library with some fake constraints, decompile it, um, make the appropriate changes in the IL, and then recompile it with ILDASM and ILASM, the c -sharp compiler itself handles those constraints flawlessly. Um, so I've actually got... I think it's useful. Yeah, I, I think it's the kind of thing where you don't want to look at how they're making the sausages. Um, <laughs> But it's useful, so I've got a bunch of extension methods on enums, which are strongly typed and which do not box because they are um, constrained that it is a struct. Uh, they don't box and you can say, ah, does this enum value have any of the flags, whatever, all kinds of things that are useful to be able to do to work around a language flaw. Now, who can guess what this is? It's JavaScript using jQuery, yes. I have no clue what this is about. It's, it's wrapping foo in J, uh, jQuery that does some funky stuff. I don't really know what funky stuff it does because, as I mentioned before, I don't do web things, I don't know JavaScript, I don't know jQuery. This looks like insane black magic to me. This looks like the kind of thing if... I don't know what happened the first time. Is it John Resig? Is he the jQuery guy? Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine the first conversation that John Resig had with someone saying, right, you'll never guess what this lets you do. <laughs> but it's worked. jQuery clearly works and is a very popular library. To take dollar and make that a first class citizen as a way of doing stuff and sort of going into jQuery land. These are examples of things that we could all agree violate all of the normal common decency of languages and libraries. But put them together with a lot of care, and that's why I was sort of reluctant to talk about unconstrained melody in the same breath as 
link to XML and jQuery because it's just a tiny little thing that I've done in a bit of spare time. But this is, this can be beautiful. So sometimes we have this borderline between good and evil, and it's a very fuzzy borderline. One man's evil can be another man's good. As an example of this, oh, I've missed the slide. I think I didn't draw it yesterday. Could you imagine the text checking new expectations, open brace, open brace, close brace, close brace. So I'll write it in the IDE. This is what happens when I don't do slides until 11 o'clock the night before. So this is how, in JMOC, you express, idiomatically, some expectations. We, we will assert that things are called here. And this takes the type literal idea that we had before, and goes one step further, and says, the code that we put in here, I want to be part of an initializer block in the anonymous inner class that we're creating. So it gets called, effectively, as part of the constructor. And this, for me, is a line of evil too far. Um, I've never been much of a fan of JMOC, but there are plenty of people who do like it. So I really only brought it up to say that um, your mileage may vary. There are bits where evil code can be horrible to one person. You know, I don't know whether Tony would like this. I'm pretty sure evil code hedge kitty would. Feels a little bit too far to me. I will give one more example of evil code, which, again, I think is going too far. And I can say that because this time it's another one that I've done. Um, but which is genuinely useful. Not so no resolution. Link. So this was another stuck over for a question. How many of you have used Link or at least sort of are reasonably familiar with it? Okay. So, I'm going to create a fake DB context. And um, let's just give it a string, um, get a table. So, obviously, in reality, this would be some um, real database thing. And suppose we wanted to do a query where some of the query is expressible in SQL and some of it isn't. So I'm going to give an example of, I want to find all the strings in my table which start with foo and which have a hash code of less than zero when you apply the .NET hash code to it. Clearly that's going to cause trouble for SQL, um, especially if we're going to an Oracle server or something. We can do that, and we can do that without any um, any fiddling around, any um, evilness really. Uh, dot get table. Where um, x starts with foo as innumerable where x, x dot get hash code less than zero. So I'm just going to outdent this a bit, which will look horrible in the context, but um, make it easier to read. So, <laughs> I've noticed this. Visual Studio and ReSharper really don't like it when you try to write code for presentations, particularly if you try to make up language syntax on the spot. They will, IntelliSense will give you all kinds of helpful hints that really don't help you when you're trying to do something wrong. Um, 
So this works, but it sort of forces you to use lambda syntax, or whatever you want to call this form. Um, and someone had said he, want, he prefers query expression syntax. He wants to be able to do from x in new fake db context dot get table where x dot starts with foo uh, where x dot get hash code less than zero um, select x and he wants to put something in there. Is that readable by the way? It's still vaguely readable. Um, and the guy wanted to put something in there. Without, we want to call as enumerable here because this bit is going to fail if it gets as far as the database. But there's nothing in query syntax within C sharp which will work. Now, I know, having read the spec several times on this, that. This code here basically gets compiled to this code here. Well, if we put that there, I think the rest of this will... There we go. So we, if we could find something that we can do in query expressions, instead of as enumerable, but that would call as enumerable, we'd be away. So what have we got? We've got select where... Order by, order by descending, um, if we use those, we've then got then by and then by descending, join, group join, various options. I chose where, just as a way of doing this. And you think, I want to come up with something that will be expressible here, but I don't want to end up calling I queryable, or the normal queryable dot where. Now, just to remind you, Queryable dot where looks something like this. Public static uh, i queryable t where this i queryable t. I, I chose where partly because it didn't change the where never changes the type of the sequence that's coming out of it. I'm like select. We don't want to change the type, so it seems a natural fit. Um, expression func t bool predicate. Now that's interesting, because that means any where clause that's going to call this, you have to give it a predicate that will give a bool. This method will not match if you give it something that returns a predicate that returns something else. We can use this. How about we come up with our own evil queryable, which has... this, but take something else. Let's give it string for a moment. We don't care about the predicate itself, we're just going to return source dot as enumerable. Let's get rid of our bad queryable here. So, this is what we want to end up with effectively. And we can do something like where Fred. Here, let's put some diagnostics in. And actually, we now want to return i innumerable of t because we want to force the whole of the rest of it to go into. Um, linked objects. We're going to need to return some stuff. Um, <coughs> oh. Yeah, we need to make this a generic method. Apologies. There we go, right, it now builds, and if we run this, even though we're not actually evaluating the results of the query, 
we can tell that as innumerable is being called. But this looks a little bit like something you could accidentally do. So how about we do now? It's been a while since I've written this. So we need to come up with something that won't be a literal. I want to be able to do where evil queryable dot um, fake as innumerable. So what does fake as innumerable have to look like here? Well, we go back and we think, what's this going to be translated into? Where x goes to evil queryable dot fake as innumerable. OK, so we can make that a constant. That will still work. What should we make the type of this? Let's create a nested type called it called hack token. Um, and we'll make sure that it can never be instantiated properly. We're not going to make it a static class because we need to be able to represent an instance of this, even though we're not going to create any instances. Um, we'll call this fake as enumerable equals null. And now we'll take a func, func t hack token as our predicate. And now the build succeeds. We can run it. We still get calling as enumerable. And now we've, you know, obviously we would name this appropriately if we wanted to do this properly. But we've got a way of making it clear what we're trying to do. If we try to go back to you know, some random mistake because we used x dot substring instead of x dot length greater than whatever it is, we get a problem. So we're limiting the evil to things where we can tell what we're doing. But it's taking the idea of link query expressions and subverting it, let's say. There are lots of weird and wonderful things you can do with link query expressions. This is probably, out of odd things that you can do, this is the one that I've seen that sort of tempts me most. I think it's still on the wrong side. And actually, straw poll, assuming we gave a, a better name to this, how many of you would be reasonably comfortable with this in your code base? A few. OK. I, I didn't expect many. I wouldn't have been surprised if there hadn't been any. I will just say that, OK, here we've got a couple of where's. This could make a definite difference in terms of readability, because query expressions can be much, much more readable in some cases than the equivalent numbers. What I would normally do is var query a equals the first bit. So pretend that this is some long query that we really want to have as a query expression. Select x. And then I do var query b equals from x in query a dot as enumerable. And then I'd have the rest. It does split it into two. And it forces you to have this local variable but it does mean that you don't need the evil bit. So that's my contribution to um, somewhat borderline things. To get back to where we started, I would urge you to take a gleeful delight in the language or library that you're using. Push it right to the boundaries, even with a real problem that you're working on, so long as you never ever commit that code to your source control. <laughs> Spike it, by all means spike it. Maybe even spike it in an evil branch and commit to that branch. And then you can share it with your colleagues and you know on Friday afternoons. Be a great way of winding away the time. But push those boundaries and develop exotic tastes. And then rein yourself in. Talk to your colleagues and find out what their level of um, acceptance is. If you're working in a team that is happy to learn about some slightly different way of doing things, 
and give it a try and push themselves, then that's fabulous. They may be able to build on your somewhat evil idea and come up with something truly monstrous. You know, most of my evil is done solo. I have no idea what team evil could look like. Read specs. Where have I put specs? There. Report bugs in compilers. And the more exotic your code is, the more likely you are to find those bugs. And then, as I say, rein it in for production. So I have two slides for questions. One is, do you have any great examples in your languages or libraries where there's something that's really twisted? Yeah, I came up with the, the jQuery and um, Juice and JMock examples. There aren't very many other fairly mainstream examples of evil. Any that you would like to share at the back? Collection initializers, yes. I nearly included this, actually. Um, so this is, in C Sharp, we can do, uh, in fact, I can do it in this new list of stuff. We can do a ABC, DEF, GHR link. In Java, you can't do that, but what you can do, and forgive me, Visual Studio, this will be Java. We need more braces. Must go deeper. Add ABC. Add DEF. Add GHI. So this is um, very similar to the JMOC. Is that a reasonable um, example of what? Yeah. And you can set properties on this, etc. Um, let me just scroll this down. Um, it's very much like the type mock way of putting, injecting code into an initializer. It's horrible in terms of this is creating an anonymous, a new anonymous in a class, each place in the code where you've got this, which is just grim. Um, it's a complete abuse of the inheritance of initializers, etc. And unlike test code, where you would get JMock, you might end up using this in production code, and you get that smell of us in what's actually going to be running live. I'm not going to say that the performance hit is going to be significant, because it almost certainly isn't. Um, but it's just it's just not nice. Any others? Nice one, though. Thank you. Yes? Uh, MVC, MVC is full of this stuff, but the, um, the using anonymous types to yes. represent dictionaries where the keys are the, the property name. I nearly put this in, but I didn't on the grounds that, you know how I say I don't do web? I don't do MVC either. So um, I believe you do something like, um, IntelliSense is really going to hate this, something like um, label for, uh, sorry, at HTML dot label for, and then new um, you know, name equals John, age equals 35, or whatever. Um, possibly not in HTML label for, but in, in action result or various things. It uses anonymous types all over the place and then uses reflection to um, pick out that that is a label for that value, um, which is quite a neat thing to do. Um, another example of evil with um, anonymous types, um, suppose we have static void foo um, string x string y string z, and suppose it's okay for y to be null, but not for x and z. I could write, if x equals null, throw new argument exception, argument null exception, x. And then do the same for z. And that's taken up eight lines of code just to validate two, par uh, two parameters, two arguments. Um, yes, you can do it without braces if you really want. But how about you do new x z dot validate not null, where that is an extension method on uh, a generic extension method with a um, a constraint saying it has to be a, a reference type, um, and because we'll only end up with one such type, it can do things in its type initializer to do all the reflection and find the properties and possibly even compile them into delegates. Um, so that it can do this quickly. 
and it's getting the name and the value just from that x and from the z. Um, that's another borderline, but I think it's even further away from the borderline. Um, I'm not terribly keen on that, despite having come up with it. Um, any others? As you say, though, uh, MVC full of these things. And dynamic, um, the use of dynamic in C-sharp 4 has had lots of things which you'd argue probably aren't evil because half the point of being able to do dynamic typing and respond dynamically is that you can write, um, you know, uh, execute, query, um, select at star from books where author equals one, and then, uh, sorry, let's name our parameter here. And then we'll use a named argument, author John. Whatever, you get the, the picture. And it's only through um, named arguments and dynamic typing that it associates that author with that author. So you can switch things around in, in terms of the um, query without breaking the association between values and front names. Any other examples? Okay, come and uh, submit them to me later. And second part of the questions is, any questions for me? Yeah? So you're going to head up an organization called Evil Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> How would I do that anonymously? <laughs> no, I, I'm very public with my evil. In fact, um, if I bring up my blog, um, you Yes, I have a whole tag on my code dedicated to evil code, um, where the most recent part, I can't remember who it was um, on Twitter, was uh, saying their head might explode <laughs> um, if I started going through all this code. Um, this is explicitly violating the C-sharp 5 language spec by getting a continuation in the async stuff and remembering its state so that we can execute it more than once and get back to the same point in the state machine. Um, to implement the come from um, control flow. <laughs> yeah, uh, read it. I'm not going to go into it now. Um, okay, any more questions? In that case, thank you very much. <laughs>